when I was in college, I went to a Texas Rangers game. And um, besides sweating through my clothes, I experienced something that completely blew my Yankee mind away. <laughs> and that is that when a certain song comes on the loudspeakers, Texans stop what they're doing and they sing and clap in unison. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? The stars at night are big and bright. See? Every time. You could find people in a crowd that way. While I was at this game and in this moment, I was also with a friend who um, was a worship leader at a local church and incredibly talented and he had a really soulful voice, the kind of voice that when he sang, it almost made you want to cry. Um, and he was also very like strong and silent, stoic type. You know, he didn't say much, but when he did say something, it was incredibly profound. And in this moment, he kind of stood there with this half smile on his face and he looked at me and he said, see, we're made to worship. It struck me so hard that this memory is burned into my mind. His shaggy hair and his glasses, his arms crossed, that smile on his face. And I remember hearing the rest of this song a little differently. Watching people give praise to the state that they love so much. And it brought me a little bit of joy, actually, to see that perhaps our capacity for awe and adoration and worship is not necessarily a product of our faith, but perhaps a part of our humanness. Mm. A gene for worship? A blood type for worship? Could it be physical, anatomical, that our desire to worship and stand in awe is ingrained in us as much as the kind of food we like, the people we find attractive, or the art that we see as beautiful? Mm. So much so ingrained in us that we can't even stop it at times. It cannot be contained. We're reading through Brian McLaren's book, Naked Spirituality, and so we're on the chapters entitled, Oh, the awe and adoration that we practice in our worship. And, and McLaren references this idea of uncontainable worship. Um, in fact, he references it in a historical fashion where he talks about pews and organized sanctuaries that were created to keep those dang medieval Pentecostals in check. <laughs> they were prone to bursting into song and dance, and, well, they wanted a little more organized worship than that. So, even though this structure exists to contain our human desire to worship, I think the truth that we all know is that people break the rules. Mm. And this idea is also named in his book as he refers to temporary autonomous zones, or TAZs, as I like to call them. It's this idea that he borrowed from um, another writer, philosopher named Kester Brown, who defines it as places where normal patterns of hegemony and homogeneity are broken. Now, I don't know that faith has a monopoly on TAZs necessarily, necessarily. neither do Pentecostals. Um, certainly people are capable people are capable whether they believe in God or not of worshiping and standing in awe of something or someone just consider Burning Man Woodstock Mardi Gras and that is just existing in the world when we consider our faith um, let us think of charismatic worship where people wave flags and dance and sing and speak in tongues or consider from our scripture reading a bunch of men in a boat and a man steps out of the boat and goes on to the water to follow a ghost like Christ in the middle of the storm there is something beyond us that draws us or draws out of us an expression of joy wonder and merriment and I personally believe in my theology, this is just part of how we're made. As a Mago Day, and as a member of God's creation, I directly connect my experience of awe and wonder with who God is. When I see a beautiful flower, when I hear a powerful song, I'm inclined to say, oh wow, God. 
And likewise, when I'm in distress, my heart is inclined to say, oh, God, help me. And we see this in scripture, this human expression of awe punctuated with one letter, one beautifully organic letter of O. O Lord, how many are my foes. O Lord, you are my shield. O Lord, deliver me. Answer me when I call, O God. O oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. O oh Lord, make me lie down in safety. O oh Lord, heal me. O oh Lord, rescue me. O oh Lord, save my life. O oh Lord, how majestic is your name. O oh Lord, you have not forsaken those who seek you. O oh Lord. <clears throat> o oh God. OMG. <laughs> I went through the Psalms and pulled out these O expressions, and they're in sequence. They actually occur... Um, with a lot of repetition in just the first seven psalms. So imagine how many more there are to come in the rest of the psalms. But I love the pattern that emerges. It's so human and comprehensive, and it displays awe and wonder and amazement at all stages. Awe at the problem. Awe at God's silence. Mm. Awe at God's potential. Awe at God's answer. Mm. Awe at God's faithfulness. We are awing all over the place here. But what's not here is pews and neatly organized thoughts and procedures for interacting with God. The O seems to demolish the aisles and the rows, and it swirls it all into one big pot of fear and praise and reverence and interaction with God. And I think in the beauty of the Psalms, we observe that this somehow allows us to walk away knowing that we are not overcome by X, Y, Z. We walk away knowing who God is in the face of X, Y, Z. And with our scripture this morning, I see the same kind of interaction with Peter, except it's a little more complicated. This story comes in the 14th chapter of Matthew, which is about halfway through the book, which means Peter has experienced who Jesus is. He knows what Jesus is capable of. He wants to be with Jesus, and so he gets out of the boat. He walks toward the object of his awe and adoration. He steps out of the metaphorical pews and aisles. And then he and Jesus sang deep in the heart of Texas together, right? <laughs> no, the swirling O around him overcame him. Oh, Jesus, save me. Oh, no, I'm sinking. Oh, how the storm rages. And perhaps at this point, the boat actually seemed like a better option. The pews might seem like a safer place. Peter sinks. Jesus has to pull him up, stop the swirling, and then after this, Peter is finally reminded who Christ is. And that's where I want to pause and sit for a minute and ask you a question. Have you ever considered that the amount of awe in your life is directly connected to who you perceive God to be? Our expressions of awe and wonder, whether out of adoration or praise or fear or anger, Perhaps that informs who God is for you. If we can watch the news and see people shot in their own homes and compartmentalize it, be numb to it, then what good is a God of mercy and justice? Amen. If we can hold a, a newborn baby for the first time and not be filled with emotions for new life, then what good is God the creator? I mean, the reality here is that God is God. How we view God doesn't actually change who God is in and of God's self. Peter being overcome with the, oh no, doesn't cause Jesus to sink. Peter sinks. God is God. Jesus is Jesus. But how we understand God is directly tied to our awe and wonder. How we see God is directly tied to our awe and our wonder. And again, McLaren 
and I tend to agree on this point, as he states in his book, contemplating a loving God strengthens portions of our brain, particularly, particularly the frontal lobes and the anterior cingulate where empathy and reason reside. Contemplating a wrathful God empowers a limbic system which is filled with aggression and fear. It is a sobering concept that God we choose to love changes us into his image whether God exists or not. Texas becomes a little bigger and brighter when we sing about the stars at night. Christ becomes a little more merciful when he pulls Peter out of the water, and God becomes a little more capable and attentive when he answers the psalmist. How we worship God in the good and the bad and the ugly is who God will be for us. Mm -hmm. Scary thought, huh? I have this little journal that I started about 10 years ago. Um, I've not been great at keeping up with it, but it's an answered prayer journal. And the reason I started it um, was because I was so verbose in my normal prayers and it was so hard to go back and sort through all of this writing that I did that I just made it more efficient. And I said, I'm not going to write all the things down. I'm just going to write when God actually answers something. And um, little did I know this would be one of the most powerful experiences in my faith development. Um, I want to show you this one or just at least hold it up. There's a picture here you can see. It's a newspaper article from the Daily Campus, which... Rest in peace is no longer no longer printed at SMU because print media is going out. But this is a news article um, about a girl. And before I tell you what the article says, let me tell you why I cut it out. Um, when I was working in student services, um, I worked a lot with transfer students. And there was this one student in particular that came to me. Her name was Audrey. Uh, she transferred from Collin County Community College 4.0 super dynamic. Everything she touched turned to gold. Her professors loved her. Her classmates admired her. Her student services personnel always wanted her to volunteer at events. She was just incredibly dynamic and had a bright future ahead of her, had a full scholarship to SMU. And um, on the morning of Wednesday, uh, it was September 16th, um, she was sideswiped by a car that ran a red light. She was immediately brought to um, Baylor, and her, her brain activity was next to none. Her brain was swollen. Her body was starting to shut down. And everybody who had been blessed by her in her time at SMU started to pray. We didn't know what else to do. And I've prayed for a lot of students in my lifetime, but I don't think I ever prayed for one as hard as I prayed for Audrey. And time passed and uh, people move on as happens in tragedies. And about a year later, this article was published because Audrey had recovered and had returned to campus. Amen. Yeah, thanks Chuck. Um, and I put that in here because I'm not saving it to say definitively that God showed up and healed her and brought her back to campus. And this prayer, my prayer, everybody's prayer is the reason that that happened. And not necessarily discrediting science or maybe even luck or a combination of, or perhaps there was some kind of collaboration between medical science and God's power. I do not know if her recovery was a miracle of God. But when I look back at this journal, I think, well, it sure could have been. That's the kind of God I prayed to. Mm. And that's the kind of God that I saw acted. When I look back at this journal, I am in awe of the ways that God has been present through my prayers and in my life. And all of a sudden, the pews don't seem that safe anymore. The boat doesn't seem like the best option. When I am reminded how unexplainably good God has been to me, my inner Pentecostal is activated and my awe cannot be contained. 
I am in a temporary autonomous zone of worship that breaks all the rules, overrides all the logic of how the universe works because I'm experiencing a God that does not exist in a box. Mm. Rather, a God that operates in that beautiful, wonderful, organic letter. Oh. So I ask you this morning, where are you? Are you out of the boat or are you in the pew? Are you experiencing the awe of God so that God becomes awe-worthy? If you're not, then start a journal. Record the ways that God has already demonstrated God's awesomeness to you. And if you are out of the boat, then let's sing and praise and stand in awesome wonder of the God we proclaim. Amen? Amen. Amen.